Thank you for the introduction uh, and the kind words. Um, I appreciate the invitation. It's an honor to be here, and, and thank you all of you for your attention. Uh, as a preamble, I'd like to respond to something that was mentioned right before the first talk. Teresa cited this, uh, this book by John Steinbeck, a US author called Of Mice and Men. And indeed, it's about two migrant farmers that in the 1930s uh, travel around the United States, and one of them is simple-minded, and at the end of the story, he tragically is killed. Well, the title of that book uh, originates from a poem from 1785. Uh, by Robert Burns, an Irish poet. And I bring this up because I think uh, a piece of that poem will help connect uh, my talk and the one that, that was previous, and also uh, this idea of bioart and a theme of the, oh, sorry, a theme of the, uh, of this gathering uh, connecting to the other. So this poem is titled To a Mouse, and I'll set it up for you. The premise is that a farmer in Ireland is tilling the soil in the spring, and he accidentally, well, in the course of doing that, he uh, opens up a, a mouse nest, and they all kind of scurry around. And the poem is like his apology to the mice. And it's in Old English, and it goes on for a while. But I'll just read a little bit of it. And it's, it's remarkable that this was penned in 1785. It goes. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle, mouse, at me, thy poor earthbound companion and fellow mortal. Okay, what follows is not poetry but prose. So, okay, just to explain it in a thumbnail who I am and what I'm doing here. I uh, am the author of this book, BioArt, that was released in October. It profiles uh, 63 different uh, art collectives and artists that in some novel way or in some what I find uh, telling or interesting way incorporates biology in their work or through their art make some kind of response to or comment on how our shared concepts of identity, nature, and life are changing as a result of all this accelerating research in the life sciences. And so it's a kind of, it's a move or maneuver, I think, to, to broaden the territory, to claim more territory for bio art as a practice. I'm objecting a little bit to this uh, consensus that seems to be shared that it, it necessarily has to do with working with living stuff uh, like slime mold. I, I love slime mold, but I, I would also say that it, uh, it can exist in a, in a photograph as well as a petri dish, this kind of art that's, that has this relevance. And um, also in this book, I argue that the function of this kind of art can be uh, akin to journalists writing the first draft of history, that, um, or, which is more uh, sort of captured well here by this quote by Susan Hiller, artist and historian. And how I got here includes, uh, I must mention, this, this first book that I wrote uh, that Sasha also mentioned and is featured in um, called Biodesign. And it was a more sort of more of an investigation into the practical side of working with biology and applying it in the fields of architecture, industrial design, uh, graphic design. And along the way of, of writing that book, I came across all these art projects. And that led to the second project. So, very, uh, very roughly, or very briefly, this first book included projects like this one, root bridges in northeastern India that are grown and designed by way of coaxing the root systems of these rubber trees across a river. And it will take you know, 50 to 100 years to make something like this. And it could last for many more hundreds of years, uh, developed in a place where they experience more than 1,000 centimeters of rainfall in a year, so at any given time, um, some of these waterways are very treacherous to cross. And also, of course, newer projects like the Moss Table by Alex Driver and Carlos Peralta that takes an ordinary moss and uh, harnesses the symbiotic relationship that those mosses have with microbes in the soil. Uh, in a nutshell, am I? In a nutshell, 
the, uh, the photosynthesis of the, the moss releases some chemical compounds into organic compounds into the soil. Those are metabolized by microbes that in the uh, processes of their metabolism release a small trickle of electrons. Those can be absorbed and by a very thin carbon fiber that goes inside these little pots. And if enough of those are strung together, you can create this weak current that is enough energy to power small appliances like lights and, uh, and a clock. And I am admiring of work like this in particular because it uses moss, which is a very common organism. We're not afraid of it. We don't have any built-in sort of ick reactions to it. And it's being incorporated into a design that's very recognizable and every day a table. So to me, the more projects like this that come along, the easier it is for people to accept the idea of maybe using microbes and things like uh, and material technology. A reason why we have that ick reflex, a reason why people I think are so resistant to this idea of biodesign and also by extension bio art, is what we should recognize as the the long legacy of human suffering and death at the hands of infection and disease. This is a picture of, in 1918, people suffering from the Spanish flu uh, in 1918. By the way, the Spanish flu was just named that because neutral Spain in the First World War was the only place that were honest about the numbers of deaths. Um, and then people just assumed that it was uh, of Spanish origin because so many people died there. Plague and death by infection dramatically dropped off in the late 19th century, early 20th century with the germ theory of disease and then the subsequent development of reliable antibiotics. But this didn't happen until the 1930s. So you know, now we're, we're relatively safe. Things are still, you know, diseases are still a problem, but relatively speaking, we are in this kind of very safe zone and yet we have this like built-in hardwired resistance to uh, living stuff. Um, and that manifests itself, it was just a nice picture of cholera that used to destroy populations in cities. And so one of the ways that this fear is materialized is by way of uh, how we design and make things. And this building, uh, the, the Seagram building in New York City by Mies van der Rohe, uh, is regarded by many people as the epitome of, of modern design, that uh, mid-century modern design, that it is this like perfect uh, functionalist form, even though it has decorative bronze beams stuck to the front of it, but it's this like highly influential rectilinear modernist building that um, has been recently revealed to be incredibly energy inefficient um, and uh, and just like very, very hard to maintain, although now it's a landmark, so it gets very complicated. But I bring this up because I think the modernist aesthetic of the rectangle of the white cube of the very controlled and sanitized space is an outcome of this, this kind of fear that we have of biology of, of being dirty, of ensuring that we're not exposing ourselves to things that can make us sick. And the reaction, the overreaction to this fear uh, can be seen in the embrace and the overuse of cleaning products and uh, the amount of times that we shower, the you know, attempt to futile, you know, the futile attempt to sanitize so much space um, when um, all that's really necessary is, uh, well, attempt to sterilize it and we, all we need to do is really sanitize, which is much less extreme. And of course, by extension, this act makes uh, more danger eventually because we Breed, we end up breeding microbes and, and other things that are resistant to uh, cleaning agents. And this fear, again, is also a reason why architecture like this, which I write about in my first book, is like harder for people to accept, and yet it is coming along. And a work like this, I would argue this is a vertical forest. It's a project in Milan that's just finishing uh, by Stefano Bori, and it introduces M massive amounts of uh, biomaterial, of, of small ecosystems, uh, integrating them into a residential building. And this kind of value creation that we don't know how to measure yet, and we just can really talk about it in anecdotes, but this is akin to, I would say, like coral reef or an oyster uh, reef where the support of other species creates value for everyone else, uh, but we currently have systems that don't really recognize that. 
But that's changing, and part of that is growing out of research into the human microbiome. Um, this is the uh, ecosystem of species that live on and inside our bodies, mostly in our guts, but they number uh, very impressive uh, very impressive numbers of them live on us. We actually consist of about 100 trillion cells altogether. Only 10 trillion of those are uh, human origin. The rest are this mix of all kinds of different microbes. And it turns out that we rely on them for all kinds of health maintenance, uh, from digestion to the maintenance of our immune system, to maybe even uh, it's being discovered aspects of our mental health. And so in investigating this, I started to see projects that commented on it, projects like this from Julia Lohman, funded by the Wellcome Trust and installed in their uh, Wellcome Trust gallery windows in London called Coexistence. And uh, for this, she took 9,000 Petri dishes, and in each of them, uh, she put a picture of microbes that had been cultivated from different parts of uh, her body. And then, sorry, no, a body. Well, I don't think it was her body. But it was a body, and it was a female body, because it turns out the female body contains more of a variety of microbes than the male body. Um, it's not quite understood why yet. But this idea of adjusting portraiture, or uh, expanding it to try to include this or comment on this, um, was very fascinating and led to um, more investigation. And finding more projects about this, about the microbiome, about how artists were helping us think of ourselves differently. And then juxtapositions began to uh, appear. So on the left, there are prints by, uh, by Ernst Haeckel from his seminal Art Forms of Nature. And on the right, at the top, uh, this sketch by uh, Dutch architect Hendrik Berlach, uh, this idea that he had for making an electric light based on one of the, the drawings that Haeckel made of, of uh, tiny species. And on the right, from John McCormick, this work that's part of a series called 50 Sisters. And John McCormick is this very interesting uh, Australian professor and computer software developer who has, since the 1990s, been working on how to model morphogenesis, which is how uh, animals, plants, insects develop. Um, with computers and then run simulations with different starting points and see what sort of evolution would do to uh, a form under certain conditions. And for, so for this series, he took as part of the starting point the iconography or the, the logos from uh, big petroleum companies like BP and Esso, and he's kind of integrated them and allowed them to mutate and change with these morphogenic um, developments but the logo colors and shapes are still discernible. And this is in part a critique of petroleum companies, which of course pull out from the ground matter that used to be plants and used to be trees and is using it to create energy, create fuel that's burned, that is changing the environment and perhaps killing a lot of those species. Other kind of juxtapositions or similarities formal alliterations, historical alliterations that began to appear to me were in these works that are regarded as seminal, like the, uh, the Cream Master Cycle from Matthew Barney uh, that fuses new media with performance and ideas about uh, controlling the body or um, not really mutating the body, but let's say altering it and confronting one's double self in the form of uh, Amy Mullins, the w amp double amputee. And then with Namjoon Paik, working with Charlotte Mormon, using video technology and music performance, combining them together uh, so that the movement of, the movement of uh, Mormon's body would change what you saw on the screen. And then in, uh, at one point I was in Stockholm and I came across this painting by Max Ernst and I recognized the similarity right away with this work by Vincent Fournier from his futuristic beach, bestiary, uh, post-natural history, and I thought there must be something more to this. And uh, I, I was just sort of, the similarities were uncanny, and this li these links between the surrealists like Ernst and what some artists are doing now began to, um, for me, began to strengthen and suggest uh, more investigation. And then on to, Onto work and more contemporary work, 
This uh, is a photograph by uh, Uli Westfall, who has this ongoing project called Mutatos, where he uh, will go out to farmer's markets in, in Berlin and pick up this sort of rejected, uh, un, unappealing to, to conventional eyes, uh, fruits, roots, and vegetables, and then photograph them kind of lovingly and arrange them in these great uh, compositions that at once, like, th there's so many sort of conflicts going on here. It's, on the very surface of it, it's very beautiful, this color spectrum, but there's also this tension between celebrating polymorphism and mutation, which is part of nature, right? It's, it's a mechanism by which it ensures survival. And the aesthetic here, which is like very antiseptic and it's very ordered and it's very uh, clean. Another work by Westfall is Supernatural, which includes imagery from taken, uh, ripped off the packaging from food in the supermarket, from places like uh, Albertsons, uh, Nato, and Aldi, and then arranging them in these impossible sort of utopian environments where the cows and the chickens are really happy and, and they're you know, sitting on fresh grass instead of you know, what is really the darker reality of modern agriculture and ranching. But yet, what's worth considering here is that this kind of imagery is closer to what we carry in our heads as what nature is than what nature is. Uh, another work that, that moves on to the uh, sort of critique of the non-action as to climate change and the dangers that sort of lurk beneath the very placid surface is this painting by Alexis Rockman called Hoarfrost, which is the name of this kind of like morning dew that is frozen that disappears very quickly. And it strikes me as because it's as if Hieronymus Bosch had like risen from the grave and become an environmentalist and started painting. And this is a kind of wordy uh, quote that if you look, it's funny, if you look at, for this on the internet, you'll find a shorter and well-edited version of it, which I used for a long time, but then when I, I finally found the source, um, it becomes um, a bit tangled, but it's basically saying that surrealism felt this kind of crisis or was responding to the need to alter reality because how we thought of ourselves um, was changing so quickly as a result of the experience of world war and also the discovery or the articulation by Freud of the unconscious. And I find that some of the aesthetic techniques of the surrealist, the use of the uncanny, the, um, you know, the familiar mixed with the dreadful and kind of scary and the icky comes out in work um, that is not necessarily by people that identify as bio artists, but I think I can claim them as such because of where things are going with tissue culturing and with genetic engineering. You can sort of picture a time when uh, beings like this might be able to be made and then how will we regard them? I think it's captured here really kind of beautifully because at once the look of this thing towards you is kind of warm and welcoming. It doesn't seem scary at all, but then again, it is a blob with eyes that is looking at you. And other of her work um, is sort of more referential to art history, like this, uh, this work she calls Doubting Thomas that is based on the biblical story of uh, the inc incredulity of, um, of St. Thomas uh, that was captured so beautifully by uh, Caravaggio in 1601. But here, I think, you know, Jesus is represented or is, is sort of the stand-in for it is this blob of matter that is a new technology, or at least that's how I think we're conditioned to think of it. And touching it is a way to sort of know that it's really there um, but also, this is a, sort of suggesting to me that a kind of contemporary God is our technology. And we're left to be scared for the little boy. Other ways that this is explored in contemporary work uh, comes to me from uh, Yves Kelly and his photojournalism work, which is kind of morphed into uh, contemporary photography. In his project to, his project called uh, 
a human version where he's gone around to different labs around the world and photographed humanoid robots. And in these photos, I feel like what's happening is the, the mundane and the profound are mingling. You have uh, you know, wires and pliers and cheap furniture alongside these like you know, incredibly provocative technologies that are being developed. And they're being developed really quickly and combined with AI that can sort of simulate companionship. And it's not a small jump to, to imagine a future in just a few decades when people will begin choosing to have companions that are you know, friends and even maybe lovers that are um, computerized versions or, or artificial versions of ourselves. And so as that's happening, right, all kinds of questions have to arise and they have to be addressed and there's so many ethics to sort of to work through when it comes to creating a sentience is you know, at what point do we declare it as such and what rights do we or and responsibilities do we have towards it. Now some of the other work does include living matter like uh, that of uh, Azuma Makoto and uh, this is one of his works Shiki One in which uh, although he identifies as a flower artist he uh, you know, he works in many in many media, and he uh, in this work combines uh, bonsai with this like to me a very modernist expression of how we control and even strangle have stranglehold on aspects of nature and how that is perhaps in our character or it has been for a long time to continually do this, and he's also highlighting the inability of plant life and a lot of other life uh, to move, to migrate. Plants you know, had to evolve as they, as they did in part because they're stationary. They can't move so they have to come up with all kinds of tricks uh, for their survival and he, the artist, takes this to a kind of extreme, the idea of migration by um, taking some of these poor plants and attaching them to hot balloons that uh, have gone up into space along with equipment to photograph them. And the works, I mean, they're on the surface quite beautiful, but I think it, it speaks to this darker reality about the limitations of, our limitations in, in sort of containing, controlling, or even protecting when we want to uh, parts of nature. So another way in which the, subject of this conference connects with what I tried to observe in the book um, comes from ideas such as, as this articulated so well by, uh, uh, by Douglas Adams, that you know, artists, Heather Barnett is one of them, who you've heard a lot about, so I won't go back over that, um, really res look to the organisms that they partner with in their making their artwork with uniform awe and respect and an understanding that they have limitations in terms of empathizing with this otherness of, uh, of life. And this is a, a, one of her Ficerum experiments that uh, looks a bit like abstract expressionism and then another version of being slime mold that was done in Rotterdam. Now I only have a few minutes, so. Yeah, okay. So a collective that works as artists, event planners, uh, is called uh, the Center for Genomic Astronomy and they have done this, I think, very uh, clever project that helps to, to frame how we've always been biohackers, thinking about us collectively. And one of the ways that they've done this is by making this product that you can consume. It's a kind of barbecue sauce and it includes in it five ingredients that were developed by way of uh, irradiating the seeds of those plants in the 1950s. Now right after the Second World War in the US there was this program, the kind of peaceful version of the atomic research effort to try to make plants better. And they really didn't know what they were doing, these scientists, but they kept bombarding all these seeds with radiation and just growing what what came out of it and seeing if they had some useful properties. And to this day, we don't really understand the mechanism and how it has delivered some, uh, some great species that we use, like pep the current peppermint that is used in thousands of products relies on this. And so this collective made this sauce and you know, serves it at events and as a way to 
make people realize sort of through intimate experience of eating that they um, are part of this biohacking that has been going on for a long time. And then the final thing I'll talk about is also from the center and it's an installation that is meant to be a bit critical of the march of technology. It's called the de-extinction deli. And it takes the view that, well, in the future, we might be able to do things like bring back the uh, woolly mammoths or, um, or ibex, and we would be able to make luxury products out of their meat. And so we will, we will defeat extinction because our science, our technology is so good. Well, I think the idea here is that it's absurd, right? If you can defeat extinction in the laboratory, you're really just doing it symbolically. You're not repopulating the world with these things. You're not changing the conditions that made them extinct in the first place. You are just creating this one-off of uh, that life that has been forever destroyed. Okay, last image, I promise. And this is from uh, the Next Nature Network, an uh, image that's pulled from their project In Vitro Meat, in which they also kind of explore this idea in a kind of humorous and provocative way of de-extinctizing, that's a word, uh, other species and what that means for us. Thank you very much.